All right. Good morning, everyone, uh, esteemed panelists and uh, and colleagues. Welcome uh, to this session on the next big issues. I'm Professor Lou Marinoff, uh, Professor of Philosophy and Asian Studies at the City College of New York. It's my privilege to chair this panel. We have a very interesting assortment of speakers, and I'm going to introduce them uh, almost immediately. Uh, the session is only 45 minutes, so I'll ask everyone initially at least to be brief with our opening remarks. Uh, then we'll hopefully have time to expand our dialogue uh, and uh, invite participation if indeed others are in the room with us and able to participate. That's a little bit unclear at this moment. Uh, but in any case, uh, we will be happy to, to take questions or comments if the platform permits it, all right? Uh, the next big issues, we are uh, still in the midst, obviously, um, of a pandemic which is uh, in some places beginning to resolve itself in other places just uh, unfolding and not yet peaking at other places uh, uh, more or less holding its own uh, in the United States very uneven some states have recovered well others are, are, are now becoming worse so one can't really speak intelligibly of where we are uh, because that would really depend on one's locality uh, nonetheless uh, we're still in the midst of it uh, so our questions uh, for this panel are um, on the assumption uh, that this becomes resolved uh, soon. Um, what then do we face in terms of the next big issues uh, for the global community emerging from this crisis? We have had uh, many decades of discussion prior to this pandemic uh, at other world forums, including this one, of course, uh, and such things as the Millennium Development Goals, Sustainable Development Goals, and other kinds of global initiatives had unfolded, perhaps unevenly, but with tremendous commitment on the part of various stakeholders. Uh, so my question to you, gentlemen, ah, good morning. Uh, good morning, Paratosh, nice to see you. Uh, so our, 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 my question to you, uh, gentlemen, is, is really the following. Uh, what, from your perspectives, and please tell us a little bit about your perspective, uh, are the three most important issues uh, that uh, the Global Village faces as we emerge, hopefully, uh, and begin to recover from this pandemic. Those are our set piece uh, questions, all right? So I'm going to go alphabetically. Parachos, you're in the room. Uh, can you hear me all right? Yeah, I can. Excellent, and we hear you well too. Paratosh Gupta is the Chief Executive Officer of IL and FSIDC in India. You're our host country uh, for this meeting. So I think it's it's appropriate to ask you uh, to please uh, uh, very briefly uh, introduce yourself and uh, tell us what uh, you think the three main issues are that we face. Over to you, Paratosh. So uh, thank you, Love. Uh, I'm Paratosh Gupta, and I head a company called Kukuza Project Development Company. This is a company which has been set up for developing and financing infrastructure projects across Africa, strategically looking at uh, what India can contribute. And uh, the four shareholders of this company are the African Development Bank, the Export Import Bank of India, the State Bank of India, and ILNFS. And we are looking across all sectors in Africa, including the priorities of the, the African Development Bank, which is called the High Fives which is uh, food security, which is agriculture, uh, tr transport corridors, uh, health and uh, healthcare systems, uh, power Africa, and, uh, and industrializing Africa. So we are working mostly in East and South Africa today. And the three important things which I look at uh, in the post-COVID environment <clears throat> is looking at how to enhance the private-public partnerships with uh, public infrastructure projects across Africa. And I think for the next five years, the three top uh, areas which uh, we should be really looking at globally in, in investing in Africa would be transport corridors, which is rail ports, uh, airports, and roads, uh, food and agriculture, and healthcare and pharma. I think these are the three top priorities, according to me across Africa in the next five years, looking at a, at a post-COVID environment, because this will ensure uh, that the healthcare systems are put in place, which are very weak across Africa. This will enclose with the Africa, the free trade 
agreements being signed across 54 countries in Africa. It will include that they will address a lot of regional markets for food and agro products. And because you are integrating Africa, you need transport corridors. Uh, we are really looking at and our approach to development is different than what a consultant's approach is. We actually conceptualize a project. We look at all aspects of the project, look at all stakeholders, how to risk mitigate those projects, get uh, get local groups involved, get NGOs involved, get public infrastructure agencies involved and look at financing both from bilateral and multilateral agencies in the initial phases. And as we go along, we look at how we can get private equity funds, etc. And then once the, uh, the project is completed and operational, replacing some of these institutions through pension funds, which are looking at. Africa has huge challenges right. in risk frameworks. And we thank you. Oh, thank you very much, Paratosh. Let me just ask you uh, uh, briefly. I mean, I'm very also glad to see Africa represented on this panel. It's a it's a great continent in the emerging world, uh, and uh, we don't often have enough representation of people who are working there. So let me just ask you, are these three priorities that you've uh, cited, transport, corridors and infrastructure, food and agriculture, and thirdly, uh, healthcare and, and pharma, uh, that presumably these things were already priorities prior to COVID. Is that so? They were, but there was not so much emphasis on them, especially uh, healthcare and pharma. But now with the, the kind of challenges Africa is facing, and if you look at it, uh, if India and Africa had strong systems in this, then we didn't need to close our operations for 75 or 90 days and the country's GDP and GNP would not have been so badly affected. I think Africa has more or less largely been not very deeply affected by COVID, but that does not mean that this cannot come in the future. I think we are working across seven countries on creating uh, medical infrastructure, which is Hospitals, medical colleges, nursing training institutes, capacity building, pharma can be created. Uh, COVID, even prior to COVID, I think uh, uh, transport corridors was a major issue, but I think food and agro is now becoming a very pronounced issue because you're looking at local food chains and when you have imported food coming in from abroad, it's very expensive. So you have to look at creating local markets, local transportation networks, and how local economies can work with each other, especially when it's going to be a unified Africa coming in the next two to three years. I think these have become more pronounced post-COVID. It's not that they were not priorities earlier, but I think post-COVID, they become much, much more pronounced. Interesting. Uh, could could you please then just just briefly say why you think or why you know that Africa, as you say, has not been so badly affected? Are there particular reasons why? I mean, we're not getting here much data from Africa. Uh, could you could you please explain why, perhaps, if Africa is indeed less affected than more developed parts of the world, why is this the case? Uh, uh, no, I'll be very honest. I don't have an answer to that. I think the only country which is severely affected in Africa was South Africa. But I think they have had a 90 day lockout. It's affected their economy. But you look at Nigeria, which is one of the largest economies in Africa. You look at across Africa and I do a lot of work in Mozambique. There are just 250 cases and four deaths. My team is in Mauritius. It was closed down for 60 days and there's not a single case which is there in Mauritius today. And although uh, China has a huge presence across projects in Africa and a lot of Chinese people travel to Africa, fortunately, Africa has not been uh, significantly impacted. And I think their economies are coming back on track. And even economies which were initially affected like Kenya and Tanzania are back on the rails now. Well, I, that, that seems very good news for Africa as a whole. And thank you very much for your introductory remarks. Uh, our next panelist is uh, Murti Nuni, who is founder of the Marshall Funds, uh, an investment management group specializing in Asian private equity and public market investment mandates with a focus on sustainability and responsible investing and the promotion of renewable energy. Uh, Murti, welcome to our panel and please share with us uh, your three main talking points. What, what are the big issues as we emerge from COVID? Yeah, uh, I'm presently based in uh, Vietnam, uh, which is uh, possibly uh, one of the best countries for management of uh, COVID. 
uh, as you probably know, uh, in, in Vietnam has a 1,000 kilometer border with uh, China, uh, and they've been very quick to close down the borders and uh, also implement strong measures to make sure that uh, uh, people's health becomes a uh, priority. And the country just had uh, 300 cases of uh, COVID uh, and uh, all, almost all of them have recovered uh, with no deaths. Uh, why is this important? It's because uh, Vietnam has shown to the rest of the world, uh, particularly the uh, the Western countries, uh, that uh, strong measures by the by the leadership uh, to make sure that uh, health becomes a priority for people. Uh, people's health becomes uh, the number one priority of the government, uh, and strong measures are imposed very quickly uh, in spite of uh, uh, economic issues. Uh, like, for instance, uh, uh, about 10% of GDP of, uh, of Vietnam is dependent on tourism, uh, but uh, the entire tourism, tourism industry has been shut down for three months until now. Uh, no international flights uh, for the last two months. Uh, but even then, the government said that uh, priority of uh, health is most important. Uh, we didn't see the same thing in uh, the Western countries, and uh, you can see the, the kind of damage uh, in the U.S. Uh, but uh, what I would like to focus on is uh, what uh, the, um, the Western world is basically is going from uh, minus two, two to three percent of uh, uh, budget balance to about 11, 12 percent of budget balance. So uh, minus 11 percent. Um, but uh, at, at the end of this kind of uh, increase in debt, uh, what are we going to see uh, outcomes such as uh, the gaps in education, gaps in healthcare being fixed uh, going forward. Uh, uh, so I think the, those are the most important issues. Uh, you know, we, uh, we're going to see a huge amount of uh, increase in debt, but is that uh, going to result in uh, uh, appropriate outcomes for uh, education and healthcare uh, going forward uh, in the in, in the in the in most of the countries? I think those are the most important things that uh, we should think about uh, in the post-COVID world. Well, uh, thank you. Thank you very much for that. I'm sure some of our other panelists will also want to comment on these issues and some of their points also touch on them. Uh, it seems to me, at least from a U.S. standpoint, that we had still not recovered from 2008. Uh, at least uh, there was a redistribution of wealth upward and that the middle classes and the working classes were the most severely disempowered by that collapse and had still not really fully recovered from it, particularly in terms of the education gap and the healthcare gap. So I think that your points uh, are, are, are broadly applicable. Uh, you also said to me in your notes uh, that you were kind enough to provide that uh, that the uh, we have uh, the world on the on the whole has overexploited many kinds of resources. And has, uh, this has left us with limited capacity and no margin of error to deal with a major unexpected black swan event. Um, so, I mean, if you want to comment on that, I'd like you to. And it, with, bearing in mind that, uh, uh, to be perhaps fair, uh, just as there's a fog of war, you know, that descends on, on theaters of war and battlegrounds, there's also a fog of epidemic uh, that descends on the world. You know, we, we don't have all the clear data that we'd like to have, isn't it so? And as well, one cannot, I'm not apologizing for anyone, I'm just pointing out that it's, one cannot uh, prepare for every possible eventuality. Uh, uh, preparation is expensive. Um, one can simply not prepare for everything, uh, although this black swan event had been predicted. Uh, many things are predicted that do not come to pass. So uh, what do you think about this question of limited capacity? Can we do a better job uh, in bolstering ourselves uh, in anticipation of another crisis of this kind? Uh, let me focus on uh, one big resource, which is global debt. Uh, global debt used to be something like 100% uh, of GDP, about uh, around, uh, uh, just after the World War II. Uh, that is uh, around about the 1970s. Uh, it used to be as uh, like 100% of GDP. Now it's at 280 to 300% of GDP. Now, has this increase in GDP, uh, that is global debt, uh, resulted in uh, good outcomes for people? That is. Uh, if education, if everybody who wants to go to col college is able to go to college today, I'm not so sure. If everybody who needs healthcare, are they able to get get their uh, healthcare sorted out? 
I don't think so. That has been uh, that gap has been fully exposed during this crisis, where uh, the ho hospitals are overwhelmed. Uh, and so, basically, in spite of spending so much of uh, debt in the explosion of debt, we have not been able to sort out the basic issues of education and healthcare. Uh, so, it, is this something that we need to address straight away, uh, head on, as far uh, as soon as the uh, the the COVID uh, crisis is over? I think that is one of the most important issues. Uh, the, the the next uh, resource that I would like to focus on is uh, is basically um, of, of the uh, the environment. Uh, so environment has been exploited so much. You know, for forests have been de depleted everywhere. And what is that resulting in? Basically, we're encroaching on uh, the environment of uh, wildlife, uh, and uh, therefore, uh, some of those diseases are basically uh, are, are moving from wildlife to uh, the uh, the human beings. So, uh, so the, the, these are issues that uh, you know the, the world has to sort out uh, going forward. Sustainability is very important, and that's why uh, we at the Marshall Funds we're focusing. Uh, significantly on renewable energy. Uh, we are investing in emerging markets, renewable energy, uh, both solar and wind, wind uh, so that uh, the scarce resources uh, uh, are protected. All right. Well, thank you very much indeed. Uh, and th there is a common denominator here already that's emerged with Paratosh and yourself, Murti, in terms of uh, uh, requiring greater focus uh, on education, healthcare in particular. And you're, you're correct, obviously, that this pandemic has highlighted and exacerbated these gaps. Uh, and I think we'll be returning to this uh, question as well. Uh, meanwhile, it's a, a pleasure to introduce uh, our next panelist, uh, Jerry, Jerry Power, who's uh, gotten up in the middle of the night from California to, to be with us. Thank you very much for, of course, eclipsing a huge number of time zones. Uh, Jerry, you're on the, on the Western fringe, uh, and welcome to our panel. Jerry Power is, fa is a founder of the 13, or rather I3, is it I3 Consortium? Uh, I3. This, this font is ambiguous. Uh, I3 Consortium, a nonprofit, uh, Internet of Things, IoT organization, and the founder of I3 Systems, Inc., a company that develops and supports real-time data networks that span organization on geographical constraints. So Jerry was, uh, has, ha has had much experience in the management and uh, management technology in California's Marshall School of Business um, and 30 years experience in the telecommunications industry. So welcome, Jerry. Please share your three points with us. Sure, sure. Uh, and I'll start with a point you made, Lou. Um, you made the point that um, in battling the, the coronavirus, um, we were hampered by the fact that everybody was looking at different data, analyzing it and interpreting it differently. Um, I think that's been a real problem. Um, when I look forward to what the next issues are and, and whether you say it's, it's environment, health care, um, whether there's um, a natural disaster or a resurgence of a pandemic, um, the question is going to be is how can we better look at the data and understand it, no matter what it is. I think that's, that's a foundational question that we have to consider. Um, so that's really important. Um, we need to start thinking about data, and, and I'll, I'll, I'll say not just data, but information as part of the infrastructure. Paratosh mentioned the importance of infrastructure. I think we have to like not just look at data connectivity like access to broadband, but we have to understand the governance and the context of what the data is so that we're actually responding to these crises in an informed manner instead of just sort of, oh, I think this data means something different, so we're going to do things differently. Um, an another thing that I think we have to think about, and I think the coronavirus um, exposed this, I think um, that what we're seeing is that with everybody being shelter in place, um, we've had to use, rely much more on our internet and electronic connectivity than ever before. Um, that's, that's a good thing for those of us who have access to technology, but there's a lot of people that don't, and I'm afraid that they're sort of suffering from that. Um, and I would extend it even further, although we talk about the digital divide, I think there's a lot of divides that are sort of impacting society and whether it's male-female divides, whether it's economic divides, educational divides, but they're serving to compartmentalize society and that makes it really hard for us when we start facing these future issues, how are we going to deal with these things? Um, we've got to find, I think as as 
finding solutions, we've got to find ways to get past those divides that separate us. And the third point that I'd, I'd raise is, is I do think we need uh, a, a much stronger emphasis on global organizations. Uh, but I would add to that, it's, it's not just a matter of sort of looking at global organizations, but the global organizations, now that we're in a digital world, they have to evolve themselves to become much more resilient, much more flexible, much more agile. And the processes that were set up to sort of govern a lot of the global organizations need Need to be reconsidered for an environment that's changing so fast around us. Indeed. Well, thank you very much for that. I want to come back to you briefly on one or two of your points, but prior to doing so, um, I can see, uh, I don't know if you can see, there's a sort of a, a chat panel uh, and the questions are popping up. So those of you who are in the in the audience, as it were, uh, will be very happy to take your questions in the latter part of this session, the last 15 or 20 minutes or so, will indeed uh, be reserved for any questions or comments you want to offer, and I will be happy to read the questions to the panel and allow them and invite them to to respond. Uh, Sandeep, uh, hello, Sandeep Wasley has just joined us with the. He's just asking uh, where where Nuni Murti is from. Sandeep Nuni is based in Vietnam. All right, so that will just answer your 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 question about location. Uh, Jerry, um, it seems to me we have a primary issue in the United States with data. Uh, and this may be the case in other countries, but we're both Americans. Uh, you're on the so-called left coast and I'm on the west coast. So we, we, we uh, encompass this spectrum. Um, and our problem briefly stated is this, uh, that uh, we, we all the metrics for reopening states uh, are driven by data and nothing else. Yes. And there's there's all kinds of data collection going on at uh, municipal and state and federal levels. And everyone's reporting back to various agencies on a continuous basis. Things are being supposedly monitored on that basis. And it is those metrics data driven entirely, which will determine the phase, phases of reopening. Uh, which is vital to the economy, of course. But we have, of course, in this in this year, being an election year, there's no good year for a pandemic, but an election year is possibly the worst year for a pandemic uh, in the sense that data are being politicized. Uh, yeah, so we have real news and fake news, and that debate and that rift has opened up in the U.S. as a political issue. What about real data and fake data? Would you would you please address that? How can we tell which is which, particularly in light of the trouble we've had with the World Health Organization? Uh, and I'm not speaking for or against them. I'm merely saying there have been issues with um, with some of their data as well. So how how do you think we can we can if at all resolve this issue? How can we tell real data from fake data? It's it's a difficult question, and um, and I, I'll even make the question a little harder in that it's not just real data and fake data, but there's what's the right interpretation of the data. Uh, I mean, I can't tell you how many times people will pull up um, um, a histogram chart and show it to me and say, here's what it means, and someone else looking at the same data because they have a different understanding of how the data collection was done. It means something totally different. Um, so even if everyone agrees that the number is 37, what that really means becomes a big question. Yeah. Um, so it's it's a it's a tough issue. Um, I think there's a couple of things that have to happen, um, and and more on the fake data versus real data. There has to be a way to go back and validate or somehow to test whether the data is indeed correct. One of the things that we do work on um, in in with the I three consortium is when you start adding incentives to data collection mechanisms, people will be incentivized to sort of cheat the system and sort of to get better incentives. So how do you measure and test about, about that? And that's something that we worry about, think about, and are focused on. Um, so there are ways to do some of these things. Um, but I think the bigger part is that it requires a significant amount of transparency um, that's not generally available. Transparency in what's the source of the data? Can you trace it back to where it came from? Uh, is there detail about what the data actually means, how it was collected, how it's being interpreted? Um, the more of that stuff, although it sounds kind of wonky, the more of that stuff that's that's public, put out there and made available with the data, the clearer it will be whether we're comparing apples and apples or apples to oranges. 
indeed. Uh, you've, you've touched on, on a very important issue here. A raw number can mean almost anything, uh, and raw numbers can be used to inflame emotions and agitate masses. Uh, statistics are not self-interpreting. Uh, I, I'm reminded of Benjamin Disraeli saying that there are, there are three kinds of lies, lies, damned lies, and statistics. Uh, and, and most of the populace, uh, perhaps uh, present company included, do not have sufficient mathematical training to really make sense, if that's possible, of, of what statistics are telling us. I think they are subject to interpretation. But then we're in murky waters because we're depending so much on data. And if what you're suggesting is at the end of the day that data themselves are not transparent, uh, even if they're presented to people transparently, uh, then, then, then we need more scientists and mathematicians on the job, perhaps, and fewer politicians. But that, that will segue um, into, into our next speaker, Dr. Tomohiko Tanaguchi. Tomo, welcome to the panel. Uh, Tomo is special advisor to Prime Minister Abe's cabinet, uh, writes foreign policy speeches for the Prime Minister, is also a professor at Keio University uh, in Japan. Uh, and, and you have also uh, uh, touched on this issue of strengthening uh, uh, global uh, institutions in the wake of the pandemic. So please, Tomo, uh, uh, share with us your three main points. Uh, we don't we don't hear you. Sorry. We're not hearing. We're not hearing you. I just uh, failed to unmute my microphone. Can you hear me now? Yeah, absolutely. All yes. right. I'll just introduce uh, the second and third third of my points first and then uh, touch on the first. My second uh, point originally was to do with the um, structure of industries and uh, whether it's going to remain offshore or coming back onshore. My thoughts are onshoring and insourcing will gain salience in lieu of uh, offshoring and outsourcing. So as, let's say, for one to depend less on one single source of supply for very much um, critical good such as medical kid, medical kits, and facial masks. And that's my second uh, point. And the third point is um, totally unrelated, but uh, I look at what's going on in the state from the vantage point uh, of the other side of the Pacific. I will say that uh, losing human lives in the order of tens of thousands, in as short a period of time as four to five months. I hear many, I hear much noise. Excuse me, gentlemen, could you please mute your microphones? If you're, if you're not speaking, uh, please mute your microphones. All right. To lose lives, human lives, in the order of tens of thousands, in as short a period of time as four to five months, I think will likely traumatize many, be they in the US, the UK, or in Italy. Extremist elements of politics as a result, far right or far left, might gain currency. And whether international institutions could cope with this rising phenomenon is an open-ended question, but at least uh, people need to talk and share experiences, and especially among leaders of those troubled nations. Uh, we shouldn't um, make Donald Trump isolated. Uh, he needs to be able to speak with his colleagues internationally. My first point that I just wanted to raise initially is to do, is to do with a big elephant in the room. That's China. Uh, on the front of state to state uh, relations, uh, a realignment will take place as regards how close each country ought to be toward China. Um, the pandemic, the worst in 100 years has failed to unite us in the world. It has strengthened sovereign power nation states hold. It is firstly because people spread 
people spread the virus, hence have had to be discouraged to go about. The world is no longer borderless, but border full. But secondly, because it was born and then let loose in China, which in turn has succeeded in creating more enemies, unfortunately, and very few friends. As a result, trust is now amongst the rarest commodities. Post-COVID-19, birds of the same feather, as the saying goes, will likelier flock together. The grouping, alliance, or partnership of countries will therefore matter more. The post-modern international order once cherished is out. Second coming will be an order to be maintained by, I should say, liberal democracies and challenged by revisionists. Japan, my country for its part, will most likely enhance its ties with its age-old alliance partner of the United States and with Australia, India, Britain and France that are literally on the same boat as regards their maritime identity. And I'll uh, finish here. Well, thank you very much. You've, uh, Tomo, you've placed a lot of uh, important issues on the table and given us all tremendous food for thought. Uh, just let me come back to you with, uh, with, one or, with one or two follow-up questions. I mean, I think your, your analysis of China, your summary of it is, is shared by many. Uh, this has not been good for China. Um, and it has realigned. Certainly, there's been political realignment, geopolitical realignment as a result of this. It's not just an economic issue or medical issue, of course. Uh, but what we're seeing, and and there has been uh, there have been at least two sentiments by yourself and Jerry expressed to 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 try to strengthen uh, uh, international institutions to try to knit back together this rent fabric of the global village. Uh, but what we've seen empirically on an hour by hour basis during this crisis is the circling of national wagons. Every country has circled its wagons. As you say, the world has become border full. A great expression, a nice turn of phrase, an unfortunate one, but true. Uh, we, we've had to do it to protect ourselves. And it's the, the national entity which has emerged as uh, the primary sovereign entity in the world. Although supply chains still still have to be respected, the, the economy is still global in that sense. There is going to be this shift in manufacturing and, and possibly in service provision as a result. So uh, what does this do? This, this puts us, it looks like, on a very different geopolitical track, even once a vaccine is developed, hopefully, and, and we are over this hump of the crisis, we are still going to face a geopolitical alignment. And the other point that I think is, is supremely important, and we're witnessing this day by day in the United States, and you've already alluded to it, is that uh, the world, this lockdown, um, ha you've introduced you know, these other dimensions implicitly into the argument. The lockdown has also precipitated a kind of psychological experiment on a massive level, a global level. Uh, we've seen the world become, societies have become powder kegs. We're not meant to be locked down. People have been, by and large, very obedient uh, in the face of what amounts to a kind of quasi-martial law. I mean, states have imposed a kind of martial law on their citizens, and people have gone along with it for their own protection, by and large. But we see now a different scenario emerging with public protests in the United States, where people were formerly uh, prevented by law from gathering. Now they're being encouraged to gather and so forth. So this becomes politicized. Uh, as you pointed out, Tomo, uh, economic crises and psychological lockdowns have made uh, things very vulnerable to extremist elements. And always we see extremism rising to the fore in difficult economic times. Unfortunately, history is full of examples. Are we going to get over it? Uh, will we will we see a return of, of, of some sort of reasonable majorities speaking uh, for the for uh, utilitarian purposes and for the good of all? Or are we going to see governments destabilized? What's your view? I'd rather not be pessimist, Lou, on that uh, question. I'd rather be optimistic. But in order for one to be op op optimistic, one feels bound by others. One feels connected to friends and partners. And that is something that we should achieve. And we should do our best to um, get back. And that's going to be not so much easy. 
uh, in the post-COVID world. Well, th- all right. Thank you very much for that. And uh, last but not least, uh, this discussion has been so interesting. All of you have offered so many interesting points that we, we've, we've spent more time on each person. But uh, we do now uh, want to introduce uh, our, our, f- our final panelist. Uh, and last but surely not least uh, is uh, Ashok Raj Vadivelu, who's chief executive officer of IntelliZest in Singapore, based in Singapore. And uh, you are an enabler, a supply chain enabler, Ashok Raj, uh, an activator for delivering sustainable enterprise solutions uh, through micro, uh, through niche technologies, rather, for transformation. Could you please share with us uh, your your main talking point on this post-pandemic issue? Welcome and, and, and please share with us uh, what you think. Sorry, we don't hear you yet. Please unmute your mic. Thank you. Thank you, Lou. Uh, am I audible now? Great. <clears throat> yeah, uh, you know, talking last is uh, an advantage or a disadvantage. You know, it depends on how you take because, oh, most of my points are taken or, or rather it's fine. Like we are trying to reinforce whatever people have been talking all the while. You know, so you can take it both ways. But um, <clears throat> uh, across the panel, you know, they kind of covered what I wanted to ma- talk about. And uh, primarily, um, it is like this. Uh, no, the, the global concept has overall shrunk, even to the extent of a county or a city. Today, you know, any laws that are enforced is, even if I move from one city to another city, there is, uh, <clears throat> I need to get a pass even to move from one to another. You know, so that that puts in a lot of uh, changes to the overall supply chain and uh, the, the way uh, people work, you know. Uh, my priorities are three. Number one is the healthcare, um, not just the healthcare in terms of finding out some solution for COVID, but also uh, overall, uh, you know, there was happiness when uh, the lockdown started because people felt happy that, okay, lockdown is there and we happen to spend time. Eventually, you know, it is moving on to a depression state where, uh, you know, um, right from students to the working cadres to the elders, um, they are catching up with depression. So how do we even overcome that? And what is that message or how do we take care of that part to start with? That's the first and foremost that we need to address with, uh, which also opens up to the next one is uh, uh, to address the rich and poor. Or, uh, how, and uh, when we say it is the government or the policies um, uh, uh, Tumasan rightly mentioned that uh, the governments are trying to work, figure out ways and means because this is something first, everything. Else. So the leadership has to be really united, sharing with everyone on their experiences on how to move forward and bring along a set of panel to enable them. Because here there is no hard and fast rule. It is something new where the leaders have no Bible or a testament to go look back okay, this is how it has been done in the past and we are going to move it forward. There is no such rule over here and it has to be clearly articulated well where, uh, you know, recently I saw a social media thing to say, hey, malls are opening only because of economy, not because the pandemic is over. You know, so that brings the scare amongst everyone. So how do we overcome that? What are the measures that we put? More importantly, uh, the infusion of funds by the government, how is it going to reach the individuals? Is there, you you see India is big, um, like any other country, and there are a lot of states here. So the federal structure has to, it, it has to research be- below all the states, you know, whatever the central is taking as a decision has to pass on to every state that it even goes to the last person who is going to take and benefit that to implement anything that they want, right? So that's where we are having challenges because <clears throat> that has to pass on well. And the third point, which I, which is my own thing, is on the technology. When we say that there is a lockdown, we are all forced to work from home where right from the data to start working or to the data where we wanted to work or to take decisions or all, you know, it's all very ambiguous because we don't have it really. <clears throat> so there brings the solutions which are very important. Do we have solutions which can be quickly adopted to roll out 
and what kind of a data are we looking at and if if at all there is data available is it because today's world <clears throat> call any ai or any machine learning it all went into a black hole because no one expected this kind of a pandemic to totally disrupt the whole supply chain right so any uh, algorithm that has been defined it's not going to work unless or until you take a real time feed and then pass on to say that her oh, pandemic is locked down here it's not locked down here so it's more of uh, countries are coming back when they are first to fulfill their own internal needs and how to change the way the supply chain works and later on focus on how to go global you know so these are the points which i wanted to highlight here Well thank you very much you've reinforced some of the important points already made and you've introduced some some new wrinkles I, I do tend to agree with your observation that in fact obviously the pandemic is not over and reopening is taking place precisely because it's utilitarian governments can simply not afford to remain locked down indefinitely and citizens themselves are willing to accept certain risks with better mitigation uh, in place uh, in order for uh, economies to return to something like normal and i think that's absolutely key so it's been a balancing act all along we may later discover that we've erred uh, on the side of caution in terms of the numbers in the states in canada at least which are telling us that the majority of uh, of morbidity has been in elder care facilities for example uh, although young people and apparently healthy young people can can also expire from this so we still don't know too much uh, our ignorance is still is still almost complete uh, in terms of pathology and epidemiology and those questions will also impact uh, inevitably economics and politics gentlemen this has been a phenomenally interesting panel and i want to come back to each of you jerry i'll come back we have 3 minutes i'm going to ask you each uh, to make a, a 30 second comment what is your what is your takeaway uh, from this panel i'm so sorry we haven't the time in 45 minutes to address the comments from the floor but i will go back uh, to paratosh and ask you what is your what is your 30 second takeaway please So my 30 second takeaway is I think in a post covid world I think countries which see things similarly like I think this gentleman uh, from Japan talked about I think India Japan India and Japan are trying to work very closely in Africa and I think like minded countries who are secular and democratic look at how to enable systems to ensure that there is more harmony and there is more interdependence because otherwise we'll become a very insular world okay thank you very much harmony is is a very good takeaway uh, over to you mercy what is your 30 second takeaway please okay uh, my my takeaway is that uh, uh, you know uh, the the post the, the covid basically exposed uh, the the world uh, in which uh, the countries are not co- not coordinating not cooperating as much as they should uh if the cooperation and coordination is much better then the health care situation should not should not have been as bad it, as it is it has been of course it originated in china uh and they uh they did whatever they could uh given their system uh where uh, everything is not open uh but uh, uh whatever uh, signals that they have given to the rest of the world uh you know they they have not been taken very seriously at the right time and uh the damage has been tremendous in terms of uh, healthcare losses uh, so uh, going forward uh, what the world needs to see is uh, how best to coordinate uh, the various uh, governing systems uh, uh, information systems and uh, better cooperate in future to make sure that uh, such healthcare crisis uh, does not take place uh, and also the disparities uh, that have emerged over the last 50 years in uh, wealth gap wage gap uh, healthcare gap you know healthcare not being available to everybody uh, the poor are getting impacted much more than the rich uh, sorry the, the rich get much more much more impacted than the poor uh, and the I education have to, gap, i have to cut you off here you you we you, you the takeaways are all important we have we have to hear from the others jerry Thanks, jerry sir. please what's your 30 second takeaway we have less than a minute so please so so let, let me tie ravi chaudhry he's got a comment on the thing in in his question is is greed in technology the importance of data i want to go to thomas's comment about trust you need to have trust in the data 
you have to build trust. Trust is an investment. And if all you're doing is looking for short term gains, you're going to miss the boat. So trust becomes a really important thing when we think about working together and how do we solve these problems. Thank you, Jerry. Tomo, your your 15 second takeaway, please. Yes, I couldn't agree more with Jerry. Data is going to be even more important. And data governance is the one that uh, countries such as the United States, Japan, Europe, and India uh, will t- will uh, w- have to work together on. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. One word from you, ask us, ask Raj, please. What's the last word? Uh, I think the time is up. Yes, I too agree with that. Uh, adaption is uh, very important because uh, we are all open. We don't know what is going up and happening. We just adhere to what has been recommended, what has been told, and collaborate and succeed together. Thank you very much, gentlemen, for your for your very interesting input into this session. I'll just close by telling you that uh, uh, philosophers have been least affected by this, notwithstanding the health problems, uh, because we live in isolation and contemplation anyway. I think it also presents a great opportunity for people to be a little bit more philosophical in their lives, if but once, on top of all the other important things that you've said. Thank you so much for your participation this morning, and I hope to meet you again in the future. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, Lou.